Hi, it's me, your digital ego. Let's talk about product design. Hi, Jeremy. Nice to have you here. You used, you used to be at Google. You're doing now what? I'm still at Google. Till the end of the month. It's not really 100% public, but okay. um, I'm going to take a, what they call in German garden leave. Because if you don't know, my background is design. I started a company in, a, a long time ago, 1996, and it was a design company called Fork and Stable Media, and I miss design, and that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, so this, you're going to, Golden, stay on stage. <laughs> okay. He's so humble. Yes. No, <laughs> that's very, very kind of you. Yeah, you're going to talk with Golden, with Jason Kale, with Martin Oberhäuser and Lisa Lang about the question, how to design products People love. Exactly. I'm very, very curious. Okay, excellent. Stage is Thank yours. You. Okay, well, you guys know Golden. You want to give him a round of applause? <laughs> Golden, why don't you sit here? Okay, okay. sit here. No introduction. The only thing we have in common besides Google is we're both from the Midwest. I'm from Minnesota, and he's from Iowa, so there's more corn in his state. But... Yeah, farm states. So the next speaker is Lisa Lang, fashion designer, independent fashion designer, and she is in Berlin, based in Berlin. Give her a round of applause, please. And then we have Martin Oberhauser. I think I pronounced that correct. He's a designer also based in uh, Hamburg, not in Berlin, and five-person studio. I guess I should say. Yeah, that's cool. And then last is Jason Kale from Facebook. Based in London. Okay. Okay, so we have uh, we have twenty five we have twenty minutes, and yes. okay. I know uh, we're gonna try to skirt all the questions that I usually get when I speak on policy and stuff because that's not interesting for this panel. So we're gonna talk about design, and I guess the first question I have for all of you um, is how do you define design? So do you want to start, Lisa? Um. Yeah, uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Hi, everyone. Um, well, I'm actually like, really close. Um, what you said is like for us, design is like actually invisible because it's also usability, right? Like I can have like the most amazing designed garment, but if I can't, can't go on a toilet with it, you know, when I'm under party, or I can't charge it because we do fashion technology, and uh, it's totally impractical because I can't wash it, right? That is not good design. So there's a usability and the day-to-day -day use of it is very important to us. Okay, cool. Martin? Um, yeah, of course, it's a, it's a big question. Um, but it's, to me, it's as simple as solving problems. That sounds simple, but it's actually pretty complicated. Um, but it's really, for me, it's not about beautifying things. That's more a side effect of coming up with a good concept and a good solution to, to help people um, in their everyday life. And design should, yeah, as you said, ideally be, be invisible and, and help us to guide you through everyday life and help us with problems that we are uh, maybe even not aware of. But design can, can do all those things. Um, without having the visual background. And often for me, this, as I said, is a, is a side effect that if the concept is great, if the structure is great, the visual, the beautiful things come as a, as a side effect, which is great. Excellent. OK, Jason, what's your take? How do you define design? Um, for me, I think design is about being intentional. So um, we talk a lot about problem solving, uh, where we can try and figure out what people are trying to do. And then we try and come up with solutions that elegantly allow them to do that. And ideally, we anticipate all the things that they would run into when using or interacting with something. So if we can be intentional in understanding uh, the problems we're trying to solve and then thread sort of uh, a path for people to, when they then approach it, they can understand and, and do what they want to do. The affordances. Yeah. yeah. OK. And Golan, how do you define um, I mean, the simplest is we here, we're here to solve problems. But I think what you're tapping into, Jason, is a huge part of it where having empathy for our customers is where it all starts, right? And that empathy then leads us to want to solve those problems and leads us to do things that are, that are effective for those people. Mm. Empathy is a big word. And I think it's, it gets thrown around a lot. And what I find um, interesting is if you look at all the new company, uh, companies that are relevant for, at least for relevant, um, they're very, really based on this idea. They really take empathy. How do you, what do you think separates companies 
like a Google, like Facebook versus a company like uh, Audi or Mercedes or something like that when it comes to this idea of empathy? I think it's a sense of service. Um, it's a service layer. That's like you're not only like a producer of a thing, doesn't matter if it's digital or hardware, but also that you know we have to listen to our customer and what their needs are. Right? You know, within automotive, for instance, like I don't need a car anymore. Um, I've never owned a car in my whole life because I don't need to. I live in Berlin. I have like six different car sharing services, and I have a bicycle. Right. So my need as a uh, um, you know mobility consumer is totally different. And either you understand it and you will survive or you don't or you die. And, um, and that's the same thing in like all of different industries, right? You know, in my case, like in fashion, it's the same thing. They're like the approach and the desire for fashion is totally different. Um, and um, and it, there's a huge opportunity for like the old brands as well as like the new crazy people to just establish an entire new ser um, um, service layer. And I think that's the key point. It's what you produce is one thing, and it's very important, but also what you do with it emotionally, but also on a service level. I know, especially in Germany, you know, service, it's a word, it's a thing, it's a business, please. Um, uh, but what we can see from, from those companies who are highly successful, the top three items are really, like, tasks they're really good with, are good, are, are, it's service. Okay, cool. We talked a little bit yesterday, and let me just, uh, we, just, we uh, talked about the relevance. So I, when I meet people that work in companies, I like to ask them, why do you think your company is going to be relevant in X amount of years? And you, you mentioned for the automobile industry, that it's not relevant for you. How do you guys see, what is the relevance of design moving forward in the future? If you guys want to answer that. I think like Lisa already, already started with that or getting yeah. into this direction that um, instead of understanding yourself as a company that sells this one product and, and do everything around that product to sell it better. It's more about, yeah, offering a service. And, and Google is a good example. They don't see themselves as, we are a search engine, or we provide the best search engine. We just provide whatever is needed to, to satisfy our, our customers and to help them in everyday life's decisions. And, and um, this is pretty much what they do really good. And they are brave enough to go into all kind of different directions and just explore and iterate and be, be innovative. And I think this is what you need to do if, if you want to stay successful in the future, just to think outside the box and look into other directions that are not completely based around your, your product that you've been selling for 100 years. And that's, I mean, that's a huge decision to do, to make. And, but I think that some of the car companies understand that already and going towards this direction like mobility service provider and talking about all the different car sharing options and those things. Um, but which of them will succeed? In the end, the user will decide about that. And this is all the questions they're trying to solve. And so it's a really hard question to answer to who of them will succeed in this, but the um, future will show us. <laughs> okay. I think there's been, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, we're kind of tapping into that um, you're asking about some traditional companies. It, there's, this, there's this sort of deviation in, in design where I feel like if you were to talk to more traditional designers, or even we just rewind about 20 years ago, I think a lot of what design was trying to do was build up a certain brand, right? So if you talk about certain car companies, what the industrial designers there are trying to do is build up the brand. And it's all about designers trying to serve that brand. Now, I think there's still a large value in branding today, but what designers often talk about on stage or at conferences like this is the customers. And that's a different kind of perspective for design than it has been historically. So how your company's brand interprets those things is, is important. How it interprets those problems is different based on the kind of company that's interpreting it. But what we're largely talking about and when we talk about empathy and solving problems is we're talking about trying to make things that are really useful. Right? When a startup launches today, a startup doesn't think, you know, I need a really great branding system and I need to have like really come out there with what this company is all about. That can happen over time, but the first thing they're going after is they're trying to create a product or service that people really want and need. And that's a very different way of looking at how design's role in the world um, articulates. And I think that's also the challenge that, because those, since we're talking about the car industry, they always had consumers, customers that were looking for their product, right? They wanted it. They, they never had to come up with a demand. It was already existing. And now this is changing because, as you said, like living in a big city, Hamburg is the same here. My car is 
parked like six days of the week. The rest of the time I'm using my bicycle or public transportation or car sharing. And now they're facing this new world that they have to come up with a, with a new solution to versus everybody else wants their cars. Now they have to think of different th ways to get there. The interesting thing is actually fashion is very similar at the moment. It's going through an interesting change is because we've been used to that fashion designers tell us what to wear and they usually decide that two years before. Um, because they have to set up the production stuff like that. So, but now there's a generation coming up who, like with the internet, learned that um, whatever I want, I'm gonna get it, and if I don't want it, I just don't need to buy it because I can get it somewhere else or I can build it myself. Um, and uh, so all of the sudden, you know, designers um, just losing kind of their status symbol. Uh, so, and there's something very exciting coming in, which is called um, uh, uh, customized manufacturing. Uh, so we can do that with my muesli and like my chocolate and, and stuff like that. But also um, brands like Brada um, started to do that, where you say like, okay, I want to have the silver shoes with the pink lace and like the black shoes with the silver laces and stuff like that, which is again a huge opportunity because the biggest problem in fashion is that 30% of the, uh, of the uh, apparel production is um, completely waste. Um, and uh, the problem with that is it's, of course, highly you know, inefficient and you know, minimizes our profit margin. It's highly un unsustainable, but it takes all of the creativity out as well. So how about I just embrace my customers and say like, hey, what are you up to, right? So it's like awesome market research. You can say like, okay, so there's kind of like a silver thingy going on these days, right? Um, and then it's like, oh, yeah, maybe you know, this area wants more pink and this more black and this just like, nothing because they never go to it, I don't know, figure it out. So I think this industry is in a point now where it's running out of money, out of time, out of creativity, and now it's slowly, slowly going back and it starts to talk with its users and customers, which is in fashion kind of unheard of, except when you're like in couture and have like lots of money, because then you can go to Paris and get like the most, you know, nicest garment, which is by the way as expensive as a car. <laughs> um, so, um, but the layer, the principle is all the same, right? It's just like, hey, this has no problem that you talk with a customer, those weird things. Like, it's fine, they pay for you. Well, good. Yeah, cool. Well, so we talked a lot about customer uh, centricity. How do you, um, add, um, maybe it's less uh, relevant for you, for Martin and Lisa, but you guys both work in huge companies, and I would argue that Google and Facebook are engineer-driven. Where do you see yourself as design in the, in, as far as impact goes? Is it you being, uh, are engineers doing stuff and then you just make it nice? Or how is the integration within these companies? Well, at Facebook, we focus on impact. So a lot of that comes down to where the impact is. And when your whole business is centered around the people that use your platform, uh, that's where the opportunity for impact is. And I think that's, to kind of reference a little bit of what we were just talking about, if you want to, uh, it takes a lot of guts to tr transform your business to, the, to perform, well, to serve the needs of the people you're building for, right? So empathy is all about having um, the ability to be bold and move away from what you care about and actually try and understand what people want. So as a designer or as an engineer or someone who's building products for people, you have to get out of your own way and try and understand that. And I think the thing that's unique about Facebook and working there is that the people there we care about impact, so it doesn't matter whether you're a designer, whether you're an engineer, whether you're uh, a researcher, whether you're a marketing, whether you're, you know, whatever you're doing, whether you're just interviewing people. It's all about understanding where we can be impactful and where we can have, we can serve other people. And I think that is the shape of the design uh, world that we, that we live in and we try and embody, where we try and understand what people want and then serve them, because ultimately that's where you can actually have real provide real value in the world. And to me, that's, it doesn't matter that I'm a designer, you're just working in that way. And that's, you have to do that with other people. Um, bring, you come together, you try and understand what you're doing, and then that takes care of everything else, I think. What about you, Golden? You've been there at Google for almost a year? Yes, yeah. Um, well, okay, one comment just largely about the technology world, which is that a lot of, like in the presentation I just gave, I talked a lot about the, um, the interest in interaction design schools or in design schools that are more related to technology today. And one thing I definitely see across all of the major technology companies, large, small, is that 
designers are somewhat new in the conversation, which is what you're talking about. And you sometimes get these unfortunate situations where the people who head up design groups are people who might have computer science degrees. Now that's okay. You can learn and you don't have to be formally trained in something in order to be effective at it. But I've never found a company where the head of an engineering department had an art degree. So it doesn't work one way, <laughs> but it seems to somehow be okay the other direction. Um, and part of this is because design is a little bit newer in the conversation. But it's newer in the conversation because it's in high demand. And a lot of companies understand that design is an important part of creating a great product. And so at a company like Google, which is historically an engineering company, designers are, you know, maybe you could rewind to about 2011 when design was really becoming bigger. And, but that's about five years now, so that's enough time to start building a culture. And, and so from, I think from a larger industry perspective, there's that stuff going on. So I think it's important to understand where the leaders sit and, and what things they can kind of understand. And then from an individual perspective, being at a large place, and, I, and I've worked in a couple other large places before, I think you kind of have to always be very, very aggressive in, the, in, the, in your persistent pushing that this thing needs to be made in this particular great way, and you'll lose some battles along the way. But one of the, one of the things, of even just like I've made a comparison to traditional design designers before, you think about people like Paul Rand or these guys who would come and have these really big egos. They probably take credit for other people's work, and they come. We're going to make it. IBM, this is it. This is your. This is your logo. This is how the system works. That's it. This is one. Paul Rand is famous for giving one option to his clients. That's not the world that we live in as designers. <laughs> the technology world. We don't come in and give one option and say this is it. Um, we come in. I think we need to come in sort of like you know, fighting dogs to sort of fight for our customers. Um, so it's a different, totally different kind of perspective when you don't have the same power in the organization that you may have had um, in other fields in the past. I think that's a good segue. I mean, before we were talking, Martin, we, um, we, were, we were talking about, um, so you do work for companies like Facebook, your studio does, right? And, but you also mentioned you do side projects. Why do you feel it's necessary to do side projects when you're working on paying projects? Yeah, I don't have to say it's necessary, but it, is, um, it definitely helps you to get, get different perspective on things. Um, you, first off, you have to worry about much more things. You're not only the design company any longer. You're, um, you're in charge of everything. When you come up with your own product, you're in charge of the business, of the development, of the design, of the UI, the UX, pretty much everything. And this gives you, gives you just a, a broader perspective and, and helps you to understand your client's need in the end also better. Um, and it's just, I'm not saying there are no paid projects that are similar. Um, where you still are an, an important part of the product, and this is those actually usually the, the projects that we're looking for, where you can have an impact and, and be an important part of creating that product for the consumer. Um, but when you, when you do your own thing, you're fully in charge of it, and it's a completely different outcome in the end, especially because now all of a sudden you talk to your own consumers and you hear their feedback straight back at you. You don't have the client as a filter between you and, and your product that you're designing for. You're, you're all of that now and you, you get it straight back at you and sometimes it can even be painful because not everybody likes what you're doing and they're complaining and you have to worry about it and you have to support it and you have to, um, yeah, it's almost like having, having a baby, you're putting, you're putting something out there in the world and um, you have to care about it, you can't just let it go now. Um, I mean, of course, that's true for a, for a standard client project as well, but it's, it's different. And I think it's really helpful to do that every now and then, just to feel that for yourself and, and get this experience on your own. And if it succeeds, it, it is, has a different kind of... Um, it, it feels better. Uh, it's, um, it's a different kind of satisfaction that you're getting from it. Yeah. So this is why I really like doing it. Excellent. This so, is go ahead. Oh, this is just, um, I totally understand like, that you sometimes want to just uh, go out and just do like, your own little thing, just like, away from everyone. Mm. So like, in our team, we kind of introduced it as a, um, kind of like a FedEx Friday, so um, that everyone in our team has half a day as acknowledged as a part of their work to just do whatever they want. Uh, because we have a workshop with like laser cutters and 3D printers and a soldering iron and a sewing machine next to each other. And, um, 
Uh, but of course, all of them, you know, we try to solve problems all the time. And sometimes it also can be like little internal problems, right? So like our office manager, we 3D printed some stationery for herself because it was like really annoying to do shelving or something like that. So we gave her the time to, to just like solve the problem on her own. Um, at the same time, what I really liked is like, you know, um, I, I actually like, we have a, we have a technologist who has an art degree in our in our oh, team. Amazing. Also, like our that's um, the first time I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> so this happens when you do when you bring fashion and technology yeah. together. Yeah. Also, like our technologists are called creative technologists. That's very important to them as well. But they can sew and work on the sewing machines as well as our fashion designers can solder and work with microchips as well. And I think like this working together in a playful way because like Friday is really cool, you know. So like the boss me comes with like a slap of beer and says like, hey, um, let's party, but be careful with the machines, right? Um, and, uh, uh, but in the same time also, of course, we have to work in the reality of business. That means yeah. quality, that means deliverance, that means, um, you know, manufacturing standards. That's so much fun. And uh, uh, because we can be creative as much as we want to, but in the end of the day, we also have to make business. There's a reality to that yeah. as well. And there's a lot of discipline. But so like I'm, we are trying to balance like this, okay, we have to do this. And then on Friday, we go a little bit crazy. So we, what, what I wanted to jump in earlier, yeah, because I really like what you said, or it was interesting that you said, uh, you don't know someone with an art degree who's leading, leading a development team. Um, I think this hopefully will change over time. And I think it's already going towards this direction. Um, because you see that more and more, and of course there is a bigger demand now for designers, and more and more clients understand the, the importance of design, and that design is not just a guy that makes things beautiful at the end, uh, he's the one who thinks holistically about the whole project, and um, of course I can't guide, as a designer, can't guide a team uh, when it comes to the technical details and tell them about it, but managing a development team from a an, from an design art perspective, I think, is a, can be a great thing, and since it's working one way, I don't I think it should work the other way around as well, and so it's cool to hear that that you already do sure. that, and we'll probably see that more Friday. and more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we, like we're out of time. I just want to I want to end it with one last question for the four of you, and I'm on a, it, it's based on a documentary film from Mike Mills, and it's a few years old. And what he did is he interviewed children between eight and twelve, and their parents work at companies. They all live in Palo Alto and in, in the Silicon Valley, so the parents work at Google or at, at uh, Apple or whatever. And one of the questions was. If you could only have one thing, what would or you know have one thing if you're on an island, or what would that one thing be? So let's just go down the line. Do you understand the question? So if you could only have one, you know, if you had only one, I mean, obviously there's food and whatever, but it, like one, I don't want to say device because then you're all think techie, but what is one thing you could not live without? Let's put it that way. And each each of you have like five. Wait, but you're not as not as we were the eight till twelve year old kids. Right? I think I there's this other quote. I think. The creative adult is the child that survived. So I think we're all, we're all creative and maybe we're all children. But, you know, no, like today, if you're, you know, if there's only one thing that you could, you know, live with for a month or whatever, all things being equal with food and stuff, what would you keep? What is the one thing you would keep? You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, so assuming I can't have another person, um, I would say my capacity for creativity. Because as a human being, I can, from there I can start and I can do, I can do anything. Cool. That's not a thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's very... Uh, I think it's a thing. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're not losing that, right? If you go, you're if still, someone yeah, you puts still you on an island, you'll all, that's still all, have that's that, right? That's all I right? care about. Anything yeah. else? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I don't have that one thing. I'd say I definitely need to have, like, if we're talking about physical things that we carry around, or, right. um, I wouldn't... I wouldn't Can nail that... Couldn't nail that down to one thing that I definitely need there... Oh, let, let me reframe it then really quick, because we're out of time. <laughs> there's, oh, we have to wrap it up. <laughs> so I'll have you guys think about it. If there is a fire in your apartment or in your house, what is the thing you take with you? In your, you know, that, that's a better question. What is the thing you take with you besides yourself and your wife? <laughs> so we won't answer it, but you can think about it. And then thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Thanks.